Hello again and welcome to SFF 180 and episode 8 of the 12 Days of Halloween. Tonight, a wealthy heiress falls into a catatonic state and her nefarious husband decides to take the opportunity to rid himself of her once and for all. But will an old lover from her distant youth arrive in time to unbury Carol? That's the book I'm reviewing. Hello everyone, Thomas here, your host as always. Thank you so much for joining me. Unbury Carol, the third novel by Josh Mallerman, is another exercise in imaginative weird horror that has a smashing and original premise that doesn't always hang together in the execution. Now, on the whole, I was considerably more entertained by this book than his previous effort, Black Mad Wheel, which I covered as part of last year's 12 Days of Halloween. The story is promoted as a kind of Weird West reimagining of Sleeping Beauty, and it does overall make for exciting and suspenseful reading, even as you're aware it's requiring a bit too much of your suspension of disbelief at key points. Set in a fictitious series of Old West frontier towns connected by a trail, it's the story of Carol Evers, an affluent heiress approaching middle age, very respected in her hometown of Harrow, Married to a ne'er-do-well named Dwight, which should have been a tip-off right there, Carol has a medical condition that causes her to slip into catatonic states that are nearly indistinguishable from actual death, and which can put her under for anywhere from two to four days. Apart from Dwight, few people know of her condition. Her mother, who's now dead, knew, of course, as did John Bowie, her gay best friend, who, as the novel opens, has just died of some contagion making its way up and down the towns along the trail. And there is one other person in her distant past, James Moxie, her first real love, from when she was a spry young thing of 18. Moxie, ultimately unable to cope with the emotional pressure of dealing with Carol's condition, abandoned her for what eventually became the outlaw life, where he would go on to win fame for a duel in which he somehow appeared to kill his opponent without even drawing his gun. Now, this led to the first bit of the story where I had real trouble in the old willing suspension of disbelief department. We're told that Moxie's leaving her caused Carol such profound abandonment issues that fear of further abandonment is what has kept her from telling anyone else about her condition. And by anyone else, I mean anyone. Not the family doctor, not her pastor, or the sheriff, or the funeral director. Carol is described as very popular. And yet, she has no women friends in whom she can confide? I'm not buying it, especially as 20 years is plenty of time to get over an ex. I've read a good number of non-fiction works about the American West, the settlers and the wagon trains and frontier towns, and one thing I learned from them is that the women had a network. They would confide in each other those things that you don't discuss around your menfolk like which herbs to take to avoid getting pregnant or terminating an unwanted pregnancy. So the thought that Carol, who's beloved in her community, wouldn't have had at least a few other sympathetic women to discuss her condition with just didn't wash for me. Carol does attempt to confide in Farah, her housekeeper, but just before she can do so, she slips into a new coma. Dwight, a mustache twirler out of the old school, decides to seize the opportunity to have Carol, whom he has secretly resented for years and years, declared legally dead. Because he wants her money. Dwight keeps himself from actually killing Carol while she's helpless, just to avoid leaving even the hint of physical evidence of foul play. But he hopes that if he moves swiftly and gets Carol in the ground before she wakes up, he'll be in clover. No one will ever know! But suspicion that something is off? troubles Farah, and it troubles her enough to do another thing that doesn't necessarily ring true from a plot logic standpoint. Instead of talking to Sheriff Opal, who is developing suspicions of his own, after a visit from the worried funeral director, Farah fires off a telegram to James Moxie. Moxie has, in recent years, given up his outlaw life and settled down several towns away, and as it happens, he has spent almost all of the intervening years racked with guilt and remorse for his abandonment of Carol, and the knowledge that his wayward lifestyle was just a feeble cover for emotions he wasn't man enough to face. Upon getting Farah's telegram, Moxie immediately hops on his horse in a hurried rush to Harrow to stop Carol's burial. Now at this point, the story starts getting strange. <laughs> First, we see Carol in her comatose state, 
where her mind is active and capable of perceiving what's going on around her, so she knows full well what Dwight is planning. In her coma, Carol finds herself in a bizarre dark realm she calls Howl Town, where her sensation is that of perpetually falling. Desperate to prevent her actual murder, Carol begins trying something she's never tried before, taking control with her mind and forcing her body to move and wake up from deep within her coma. But Howltown is inhabited by a dark supernatural entity calling itself Rot, manipulating from behind the scenes as it seeks to possess Carol once and for all. It all falls into a race against time groove centered around Moxie's desperate attempt to rescue Carol before the actual burial, and Dwight discovers that Moxie is on his way, panics, and desperately tries to stop the legendary outlaw in his tracks by hiring the most colorful, if impractical assassin I've ever seen in a story, a psychotic pyromaniac named Smoke, who carries a supply of oil inside his two prosthetic legs. Smoke has some fun scenes, don't get me wrong, but he's a cartoon villain, straight out of old Dick Tracy comics. For my part, I couldn't help wondering how a killer who doesn't carry a gun and whose chosen method of murder requires him to walk straight up to his victim, douse them in oil, and strike a match, simply hadn't been gunned down years ago by literally anyone with a high-powered long-range rifle. Smoke isn't exactly shy in his antisocial behavior, eagerly making a public spectacle of himself wherever he goes, and I just couldn't imagine that no one had sent a heavily armed posse after him or put a high enough price on his head to interest every bounty hunter within 60 miles. I mean, come on, I've played Red Dead, I know how this works. Still, despite all of this, Josh Mallerman does give us some solid moments of tension, and Dwight is the kind of villain you love to hate. Moxie's trick with the duel is eventually explained, and again, I'm not sure I could fully believe him pulling it off, but it does set up a really fun moment at the climax. Less satisfying is the way a story that tries to provide Carol agency through her predicament ultimately shortchanges both her and us on that front. The premise of a woman in a comatose state having to self-rescue is a terrific one. And frankly, I'm not sure the choice Mallerman makes at the end fulfills that premise in a way that lets Carol be the heroine of her own story. The idea of Moxie being motivated in his actions by his acknowledgement of his own wronging of Carol and a genuine desire to make amends to her is an admirable way to write a male hero. But in the end, it feels like this book is just a bit more his story than hers. And that is all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180. Everybody, I want to thank you all for joining me. Once again, remember the most important thing. These are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, that's how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon. Recruits into Wink's Army get little perks, like getting early access to some of my videos <laughs> when I get them done in time. I want to thank all of those awesome people for their additional support. I want to thank you folks for being the best viewers in BookTube. And until I see you, coming up for Episode 9 of the 12 Days of Halloween, Spooky Reading. <laughs>